A casket burnt in the open air, funeral homes grappling with overcrowding. A makeshift crematory under construction in Beijing set to house 200 new cremation furnaces. A health department in a Chinese province admitting to large-scale infection for the first time. The death of a Chinese official casting a spotlight on Beijing's darkest secret. We hear from three experts. Could Taiwan defend itself from Beijing with the help of its allies? A think tank breaks it down. And a Chinese spy who publicly defected from Beijing, losing his bid for asylum in Australia. Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. First, an update on China's COVID-19 outbreak. With funeral homes across the country overwhelmed by virus deaths, some people appear to be resorting to other methods for managing the remains of their loved ones, burning the deceased in the streets. In a video circulating online, a wooden casket is on fire in a rural region of China. It's unknown if the deceased died of COVID-19. In recent weeks, other clips shared to Chinese social media capture people burning other related objects. This video is believed to be from Shanghai and shows paper wreaths and incense papers, known as Joss paper, ablaze. Burning them is a common Chinese funeral tradition. They are also used to commemorate the dead. Elsewhere, dozens of tents have been set up in the courtyard of a funeral home in northeastern China. They are being used to store corpses as the funeral home copes with overcrowding. What's more, another facility in northeast China installed at least four new cremation furnaces over the weekend, an apparent attempt to match demand for services. In Beijing, crematoriums are working round the clock to meet that surge in demand. A makeshift hospital there is being repurposed into a makeshift crematory to be complete with 200 cremation furnaces. Here's what one man, believed to be a worker on the site, said in a video. It's going to be turned into a crematorium. There is a shortage of crematoriums in Beijing. There are not enough furnaces. 200 furnaces will be built here. The makeshift hospital was previously used to quarantine COVID-19 patients or their close contacts. That's before Beijing rolled back its zero COVID-19 policy last month. In the clip, the man explains that the area where hospital staff lived was being cleaned out and would be instead used by crematory staff and relatives of the deceased. Cremation equipment is already on site. China is still facing a major outbreak across the country. On Monday, a local health department in central China's Henan province said that as of January 6th, about 90 percent of the province was infected with COVID-19. That means over 88 million people are sickened. That's about the same as the populations of California, Texas and Florida combined, the three most populous U.S. states. It's the first time since China lifted lockdowns that an official health department admitted the outbreak has reached this scale. Likewise, Wu Zunyou, the chief epidemiologist of China's Communist Party, admitted over the weekend that when the number of COVID-19 cases in China reached a certain scale, it becomes possible for new mutant strains to emerge. A short-lived obituary, giving an unexpected glimpse into the true nature of China's organ trafficking market and sparking heated speculations. This followed by another ministerial-level official dying in Beijing amid the COVID-19 outbreak. NTD's Xiaohua Li has the story. Over the years, he had struggled with diseases and had many organs replaced in his body. He once joked that many components are not his own anymore. That's what gave goosebumps to a number of Chinese internet users last Tuesday, written in an online obituary by a Chinese Communist Party official to commemorate Gao Zhenxiang, a former commissioner of China's Federation of Literary and Art Circle, who died early last month. But the news of his death was only made public near a month later, without mentioning the cause of his death. China's internet censors immediately took down the obituary. But speculations about Gao's alleged extensive organ transplant history are heating up. 
It has long been heard officials replace organs and blood. Whose organs were they? It's widely known in China that senior CCP officials enjoy certain privileges, but it's the first time a CCP official has been revealed as having access to multiple matching organs, each of which could cost someone's life. China affairs analyst Tang Jingyuan calls organ transplantation a welfare within the ranks of high-level CCP officials. We simply calculate what is the total number of officials above the ministerial level in the CCP system, including those who are retired. Then, such a large number of people, if they can enjoy such treatment and they can do it more than once, it will inevitably bring a problem. Where does such large organ supply come from? He adds that if there is no large secret pool of live human bodies within the CCP system, officials simply couldn't enjoy such so-called benefits. This matter is actually a taboo for the CCP, especially about organs transplanted to high-ranking officials. When the forced organ harvesting of Falun Gong practitioners was first revealed in 2006, questions were raised regarding organ transplant abuses by the regime. For decades, China has been accused of harvesting the organs of its citizens by force. The victims are killed in the process, and their organs are used in transplant operations, generating billions of dollars. China is doing somewhere between 60 and 100,000 transplants per year in their country, and they're not reporting them. And again, I think this isn't just a problem of ethics; this is a problem of bad medicine. A latecomer to the field, China currently has the second largest transplant program in the world after the U.S., but without a viable organ donation or distribution system. In the 2020 China Tribunal judgment, it said Falun Gong practitioners have been one and probably the main source of organ supply. Then they're essentially killed on demand for their organs. So somebody that. Has had again multiple organ transplants that lives to 90. That has had those transplants anywhere in the last 20 years. The likelihood is、uh, this official received those organs、uh, from the on-demand killing of, of, of innocent life. The longevity of senior party members have long been a subject of curiosity in China. But Hong He says as the virus rages in China, greater longevity saw its limits, even with multiple transplants. Around mid-November, there was an outbreak in a hospital in Beijing. These people have long been hospitalized there, have intensive care units and special people to take care of them. But when the virus broke out in the hospital, their advantage of being protected away from the society now becomes a disadvantage. Patients that that have a transplant that end up in the hospital. Um, as high as 28 percent of those patients will die uh, uh, from uh, COVID or from the viral illness. In a post by the American Lung Association, people with compromised immune systems are at higher risk for severe COVID-19, even if they get vaccinated. Those taking immunosuppressants for preventing organ transplant injection are considered immunocompromised. Xiao Huali, NTD News. Beijing is hitting back at South Korea and Japan over COVID-19 testing requirements for travelers from China. For now, Japanese and South Korean nationals would not get short-term visas to China. That's according to China's embassy in South Korea and several Japanese travel agencies. This comes after countries around the globe imposed travel restrictions as COVID-19 infections in China soar. Travelers from China must present a negative COVID-19 test before boarding a plane, or get tested after touching down. South Korea took it a step further. The country suspended short-term visa applications from its consulates in China until the end of the month. Beijing said it would adjust visa suspension if South Korea cancels its entry restrictions on China. What would happen if China decided to invade Taiwan, and what would a war with China mean for the U.S.? A leading think tank in D.C. released a report on war game simulations of that scenario. Here's what they found. D.C.-based think tank Center for Strategic and International Studies designed a war game of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. It modeled an amphibious invasion of Taiwan in 2026 and ran it 24 times in a variety of scenarios. Here is what they found. 
Under most circumstances, China is unlikely to succeed in its op operational objectives uh, or to occupy Taipei. And second, the costs of war would be high for all involved, as Mark said, uh, certainly to include the United States. Uh, starting on the operational piece, uh, the challenges confronting China in an invasion are sev severe. The report highlights that Taiwan is likely to maintain its autonomy in the case of a Chinese invasion. But four critical conditions must be met. First, Taiwan must resist. If Taiwan capitulates immediately upon invasion, like Denmark or Thailand did in World War II, then there's nothing that the U.S. can do in order to uh, reverse that capitulation. Second, the U.S. must quickly commit its own forces to direct combat operations against China. If there's no U.S. commitment whatsoever, we estimate that it would take about two or three months for China to conquer Taiwan if Taiwan resisted to the best of its abilities, but that that success on China's part is inevitable. The other two conditions are that the U.S. must conduct operations from its bases in Japan, and the U.S. must have sufficient anti-ship munitions. And in terms of the losses, the report says the U.S. and allies would lose dozens of ships, hundreds of aircraft, and tens of thousands of service members. The report says such an invasion would also bring heavy losses to China, and failure to occupy Taiwan might destabilize the rule of the Chinese Communist Party. Retired U.S. Air Force General David Deptula said the U.S. needs to get creative in deterring a Chinese invasion. I believe it's extraordinarily unwise from a deterrent perspective to yield sanctuary to the PRC in advance of any contact, conflict by declaring that U.S. attacks against China's mainland would be off the table. The think tank says that based on their report, the U.S. should strengthen deterrence immediately. For China's tech sector, the new year is off to a promising start. The Nasdaq Golden Dragon China Index jumped 13 percent in just the first two days of trading in 2023. The index looks at China-based firms listed on the U.S. market. And the boost marks its best record yet for early New Year trading. Some of the top performing firms are Alibaba, JD.com and Pinduoduo. Together, their U.S.-listed shares gained $53 billion in market value Wednesday. That dollar figure rises to nearly $70 billion for the week. Beijing's regulators are expected to relax their clampdown on tech companies in 2023 and work to boost the pandemic-hit Chinese economy. That's good news for China's tech firms, which have been the main target of strict controls since late 2020. Likewise, the Nasdaq Golden Dragon China Index sank 46% in 2021 and 25% in 2022. As Chinese firms enjoy the New Year surge, major U.S. indexes stayed flat the past two sessions. Even though China is moving away from its zero COVID-19 policy, European investors may not change their minds on decoupling and shifting supply chains anytime soon. That's according to Chris Humphrey, executive director of the EU Asian Business Council. The organization represents European businesses in Southeast Asia. Humphrey said Southeast Asia has seen an increase in foreign direct investment, and he doesn't see China's recent moves changing that trend. Humphrey added that for many businesses, China is now being run as a discrete market, whereas Southeast Asia is being seen as part of a larger global or Asian operation. EU member states poured over $26 billion in Southeast Asia last year. That marks an over 40 percent increase from the year before. A self-confessed spy who publicly defected from Beijing has been denied the right to stay in Australia. In 2019, Wang Liqiang spilled Beijing's espionage secrets on Australian primetime national TV. Four years later, he's now facing deportation back to China. To tell the truth, inside of me, I am extremely frightened. Wang claims to have been a Beijing-sponsored secret agent who undertook undercover spy work in Hong Kong, Taiwan and Australia. Beijing dismissed his claims as false and called him a convicted criminal. Wang was allegedly threatened that he could be sent back to China and killed if he didn't retract his story. Over the weekend, an Australian court rejected Wang's asylum application. That's over alleged fraud committed against Sydney businessman Philip Shu. 
This leaves Wang open to deportation, despite the tribunal admitting he's in danger. The denial of Wang's asylum comes after Australian Foreign Minister Penny Wong visited China a few weeks ago. She expressed wishes to restart Australian exports to Beijing after years of diplomatic tensions between the two. Beijing is looking to repair its relationship down under. China's foreign ministry said Tuesday it hopes Australia would meet China in the same direction, calling the two economies highly complementary. We hope that the Australian side will meet China in the same direction and make efforts towards the goal of mutual benefit and win-win results so as to promote the rebuilding of mutual trust between the two countries and bring the relationship between the two countries back on track. Canberra and Beijing have been on the outs for several years. The nations are looking to ease tensions. But Australia is waiting for China to lift trade blocks on a dozen Australian exports to further encourage the relations repair. China's ambassador to Australia, Xiao Qian, said he hopes a solution can be found for the cases and possible release of two Australians detained in China. On the other hand, he ramped up criticism of the AUKUS security deal, a pact between Australia, the U.S. and the U.K. Australia has refused to back away from the agreement. Xiao hinted that decision may put financial burden on Australian taxpayers. Russia may want to buy back an aircraft carrier that Ukraine sold to China over two decades ago. The proposal was made by a leader of Russia's pro-war Liberal Democratic Party. Let's zoom in. He suggested buying the warship back and putting it into service. This Chinese aircraft carrier is known as the Liaoning. The ship was supposed to become the mainstay of the Soviet Union, but after its collapse, Ukraine, as part of the Soviet Union, was anxious to dispose of the unfinished aircraft carrier. In 1996, the Chinese Communist Party began planning to purchase the carrier under the name of an international businessman claiming it would be converted into a casino. That dispelled Western suspicions of Chinese military movements at the time. The Liaoning was commissioned in 2012 and is now the mainstay of the People's Liberation Army Navy. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for more than a year. Here's what to look out for in our second half. Japan, China and the U.S. How are tensions playing out between them in the Indo-Pacific? And is there a way to deter the Chinese Communist Party's aggression? But if you can get this right and you combine the two militaries, uh, that will cause the Chinese no end of trouble. And it will and it will be well received by most other countries and the nation. We sat down with Grant Newsham, senior fellow at the Center for Security Policy for Insight. The full episode is available on our partner platform, Epoch TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. See you tomorrow.